Hi, this is Paul. This is sort of a words that fudge video, and it's a video about the resurrection because I want to talk about the word reality. And I'm going to pull together just a bunch of stuff that I've continued to be thinking about as I process all the Jordan Peterson stuff and all the John Verveke stuff. And I'm just so appreciative to both these men for putting out what they've put out and sharing and just keeping the wheels turning and keeping thoughts going on in my head. Now, now this, this word, reality, uh, where does it come from? Well, property, possession, well, that's interesting. Uh, real estate, you might notice that connection anyway. Uh, definitions are something about, you know, the state of being actual. And actual is funny because actual is, is right here, right now, or real. Well, reality, using real to define reality, that doesn't seem quite right. Uh, the reality of an event... Um, the ultimate reality of life, uh, the world or the state of things as they actually exist. Again, that's a very now, actually, um, as opposed to idealistically or notionally. Uh, one of the more interesting notions here is, uh, one of the most interesting definitions here is number five, um, obsolete. Uh, loyalty, devotion, uh, Thomas Fuller, to express our realty to the emperor. That's a, that's a very interesting definition. Synonyms, truth, actuality. You can see even just from the definition of this world word, we, we have a hard time pinning this thing down and as opposed to fantasy, which of course leads to our, the struggle that we have with the idea of myth. Now, now one of the, one of the my go-to quotes from Peterson is what he said, shared with Roger Scruton in terms of just a real brief, um, just basically again, again and again, he says, you know, the world is too big. We, we can't, we can't capture the whole world. So what we do is we capture these low resolution impressions and memories and, and they're not always pictures or thing or of objects. You can see reality in this, this referential sense of it that we often use in terms of truth. And in the video I did of talking about the Bogosian podcast, I went through some of the Verveke interview where he talked about this family of knowledge. There's propositional truth. There's techne or procedural knowledge. There's perspectival knowledge. There's participatory knowledge. And there's there's probably more. But this this little quote from Peterson that I use quite often, I think, I think is is very helpful. Well it, I think it's useful as an adjunct to that. So so Sir Roger mentioned that the transcendent is what we bump up against when we realize our ignorance. And so it's that which transcends our ignorance. And, and that in itself makes it an implacable fact, unless you believe that you have no ignorance, in which case there's no point in furthering a discussion with you. Um, so the transcendent is the fact insofar as it's that which transcends our ignorance. But you can also think about it technically. So, and, and, and I think we know enough about how the brain works now so that, not that we know much, so that useful things can be said about that. I, you tend to represent the world in the simplest manner that you possibly can that works for what you're doing. And so you don't actually see the world. You see sufficiently useful, low, represent, low resolution representations of the world. And if they work, then that's fine. There's no need to adjust them, and they're relatively easy to remember and to manipulate. But now and then you have a misapprehension about someone, let's say, and you have a conversation with them, and the conversation goes sideways. And what that means is that the, the thing that you thought you were conversing with is not the thing that you're conversing with, and that manifests itself in error, right? So error is the place where the transcendent reveals itself. And what is actually revealing itself is the reality that's outside and underneath your perceptions. And so what you see in the world, in some sense, is a set of animated cartoons. And a lot of that is actually a consequence of you seeing nothing but your memory. Because your brain is organized so that instead of going through all of the difficulty of having to look at the thing in, an, in itself, you look at what you assume to be there. And if you can get away with that, so much the better. But the thing in itself is always much richer, richer than your apprehension of it, 
which is partly why you make mistakes, but also partly why you can continue to garner wisdom in the world. There's always more there than meets the eye. And God only knows how much more there's there than meets the eye. And you can show this even in the religious sense to some degree. Okay, and then he goes on from there, and that's I play that clip, clip quite a bit, and and so so you have this you have this idea that oh my little uh, I'm in the way of my uh, my little illustration, so so, so well, maybe I put myself over here, there we go, so so we have this we have this idea of you know we see this world and it's out there and it's rich and it's full and of course even even a tiny little scene like this where the the dog is 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 trying to get the cat out of his bed and you know the dog eventually wins and i explained to my children that you know if the, if the dog starts to lose these battles the dog's in real trouble because he can only see out of one eye and you know the, the only thing going for him is his mouth is bigger than the cat and, and the cat's mouth and um, he can never catch the cat because the cat's way faster and more agile. And but but the dogs the dogs gotta the dogs gotta keep going. But anyway, so 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 we take this huge world and we we select and this is where you get the salience. We select that which is important and that which is important because of our desire. That which is important because of our need. That you know we have opportunities and threats. You have all of this stuff going on and we compress and compress it down into these tiny low resolution you know drawings or movies they're they're actually very tiny and they're and they're in our heads but they're not even just pictures of objects out there they're impressions and smells and memories i mean all of this stuff going on but it's all gets it all has to get incredibly compressed and condensed so that it can fit in our head in a in a movable way and i love the way peterson talks about how this is you know this is useful for us and this is this is how it has to work now here's my little uh probably two-year-old self somewhere at the beach getting a, a a sunburn that will give me skin cancer someday because we didn't know about that but here I am at the Jersey Shore sleeping away and uh, you know one of my parents thought this was cute so took a picture of me well, we all have this experience of dreaming and and dreams seem real so we're gonna talk about this word this word reality dreams seem real and and sometimes when you're dreaming you, you kind of figure out no no this is dreaming and, and then sometimes you have inception like dreaming um, sometimes if i wake up early in the morning and i don't want to bother my wife i'll put in a podcast and i'll just put in a podcast and put headphones on and lay in bed and then sometimes i'll fall back asleep and then i'll have the experience of sleeping and i'm hearing you know, whoever's on the, you know, Jordan Peterson or John Verveke or Tim Keller or someone just talking and it's like, why are they, why is, why is this, why is this voice happening? And then sometimes like Inception, the, he'll, it'll, the voice will colonize my dream. And then at, at some point I'll say, oh, I've got to stop this. And so then I, I try and turn it off on my phone in the dream and it still doesn't turn off. And I just have to come up far enough to realize, no, wait a minute, I'm actually in bed and this is in my ears. So then I'll reach down and turn it off or I'll wake up or something like that. And so it's funny how we have these levels of reality and these layers of reality. And I was talking to my friend James who comes to the, who comes to the, who comes to the meetups. And James is a, um, he's a, he's got a PhD and, in in neuropsychology and he you know he's talking about you know are we are we always dreaming during the day i mean this is and th this kind of gets into peterson's point that our mind is always putting up these images but while we're awake and engaged in the world there's this there's this this much broader connected image of the world outside of ourselves which is not subject to our control and, and somehow these two worlds meet and this is the this is actually as we'll get into a little bit later this is what don hoffman calls the interface that we are actually connecting with and and so we see things that we want to see and we don't see things that aren't relevant to us and i mean all this vast complexity going on all the time and this experience of what we're witnessing this is reality okay and if you're a long time ago I, I i referenced the heretic which was in the the weekly standard an article about thomas nagel this and it talked about this manifest image and i often had that portrayed to me quite vividly when i had a good friend of mine who 
was spending a lot of time around the church, but he had very low sight. And he explained to me that he really kind of looked out through a tube and that's all he could see. And some, and he also was, was losing his hearing. And so I'd walk up to him next time. I'd walk up to him sometimes. I'd be standing right next to him and he didn't know I was there. And suddenly I would say something or do something and be like, bow, I popped into his world like, like Barbara Eden and I dream of Jeannie and he'd, he'd pull a start back and he'd, you know, he'd be like, don't scare me like that. And was, you know, sorry, Brandon. Uh, so, you know, this weird relationship with reality that we have. Now, now what's interesting about the dream world, sometimes you can have vivid dreaming where you can kind of impose your will on the dream world and sort of like Neo in the Matrix, you know, make things unfold and happen like you want them to. But this layer of reality, this dream world, gets pierced and threatened by the alarm clock or the dog or a kid crying or the podcast. And it's so interesting how one level colonizes the other. And so the alarm clock is more real than my dream in a certain sense. It isn't that the dream isn't real, it's just that the alarm clock is more real. Well, well, how how does the physical world and the dream world relate? And I talked about that a little bit before, and maybe one of these days I'll... I'll have my friend James come on and he'll do his little shtick about the fact that we don't really dream. And it gets into this question that, you know, right already, I'm, even though my mind imagines I'm seeing everything out here in my messy office, the truth is I'm not. I, my, my eyes aren't even physically seeing it. My brain is sort of filling in the gaps. And that's the same reason, and you learn this when you're a grade school kid, you know, cover one eye. And there is a blind spot, and you can, you know, play little tricks to find your blind spot, but your 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 brain just fills it in and creates this creates this image for us. And of course, only a little portion of our eye really has that high resolution, and it's our eyes are actually always moving and it's darting around. And if I want to focus on something, you know, shh, there I do. I can focus right on it. But the rest of my eye is considerably low resolution because my brain can only handle so much. And, you know, this much we know. So is the dream world dependent on the physical world? Now, this, of course, is the, is the great debate. This is the question of consciousness. And this is the hard problem of consciousness. But we do know that they are certainly connected. Okay, so, so whether we're going to use the radio image that our brains are sort of like cell phones or radios and they're picking up they're picking up transmissions or whether it's all generated from our head, whether consciousness is far more common than I would know. I remember in the Jordan Peterson, Sam Harris conversations, you know, Sam Harris was postulating about computers and consciousness. Well, how would you know your PC isn't conscious? You know, and this gets into Brett Weinstein's idea of a programmed robot. Well, you know, if my if my PC starts talking back to me, well, it does talk back to me. It talks back to me all the time, and I can talk to Siri or Cortana or I don't know why Google doesn't give itself some some cool name. I have to say it. I don't want to say it because then my phone and my computer are going to talk to me. But you know, on and on and on. So, what's the relationship between what is consciousness? Where does it come from? I mean, we we can't really answer that question, but we know that consciousness is real. And there's something important about the physical world that, that we don't want to lose, however. And then we all instinctively know this. Um, we maintain this, I'm going to get to this slide a little bit later, but we maintain this bias for the real world. If, if, if your son or your daughter is spending all of their time looking at screens or on the internet or engaging in a virtual world, parents have problems. Well... Peterson was about ready in that clip to talk about psychedelics. If you could just put yourself on a on a perpetual psychedelic trip and lay in bed, you know, think about Soma and Brave New World, lay in bed for the rest of your life, do you think that would be a good thing? Or do we have a bias about the physical world that, that somehow this is important and and something that we ought not to lose and someone who perhaps, let's say they're uncomfortable, they'd say, well, maybe we'll put them in a will put them in a dream state for the rest of their life. Well, we would call that, what, a vegetative state? There's the part of the difficulty of consciousness is, you know, we're not exactly sure what, what all is going on in the brain. We look at different waves and we, we correlate those things to different other waves when we're, when we're awake and what can we can report to. But, you know, we've got a lot of questions about these things. 
Now, in in John Verveke's most recent, he had a really good, I think, a really good treatment of Gnosticism, and as always, he dropped some really good resources in there. And so I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna play a little bit about this, and I a little bit from this this class. Now, this idea that spirituality is ultimately about transcending the gods rather than serving the gods is very, it's very both pertinent to us today and very radical for its time because you have basically the challenging of a, not even a belief, it was just an an unquestioned presupposition that our relationship to the gods was one of servitude and slavery, getting transformed into, no, no, the cent- the core of spirituality is not worship. The core of spirituality is self-transcendence. Heal- the, the, what he said right there, and even though he's talking about ancient Gnosticism, there's a tremendous amount of, the, many, many people would say that. The core of the, and when people say I don't go to church because I'm spiritual but not re- not religious, in many ways that's exactly what they're saying. I'm, I'm looking for self transcendence. I'm looking to try to transcend the suffering and struggles of my life, the things that bother me. That's exactly how many people today are defining spirituality or the spirituality they are seeking and hoping to live within healing and freeing people from existential entrapment and their suffering and that our mythology and our practices should always be in service of us reuniting to who and what we are now we 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 now now, now we get into the se- the the secret sacred self for many people again the same language they would say well, I'm I'm trying to connect with who I really am that there's a there's a true me that has been disconnected from me and now through these spiritual practices through these transformative practices I now am going to connect up with that true me and then when I realize the true me I will increasingly become the true me and I will transcend from my secret sacreds to my I will transcend my current existence into this this true self and obviously he's talking about gnosticism here We love this story notice how first of all it's still got all the platonic elements. Here are the people trapped in the cave, they're bound, they get the secret knowledge, right, that frees them so that they can return to and see the light, right? But of course, for Plato, you come back down into the cave. cave. For the Gnostics, you try to spread the message uh, to as many people as you can. So it has the Platonism. It, of course, has a way of connecting that Platonism to Christianity by reinterpreting Jesus as the embodiment of Gnosis rather than as a sacrifice in whom we should have faith. Jesus is a teacher who provides us with something like what the shaman did and what our therapist does, provides us with the keys to unlocking Right, unlock, and and this is something I hear quite a bit from New Age friends who, oh, I, Jesus, I can learn a lot from Jesus. Jesus is in a sense my my guide, my spirit guide into this. And there's and John is just articulating exactly ancient Gnosticism, but also a certain amount of contemporary Gnosticism. Talking all the ways in which these patterns these socio-cultural, political, economic patterns, ways of thinking and being are just permeated into layers of our psyche and ways of being in the world that they just exacerbate our suffering, our existential entrapment and the way it is fragmenting our world and ripping apart our agency. So we, we long for that now. This was Hans Jonas' great insight. We long for that now. So we go to movies that show this, right? So the Connick goes through several movies that are basically modern portrayals of this Gnostic mythology. Of course, famously, and it brings, both, it brings all of these elements in, the Christian, the 
the, the Platonic and the Gnostic, of course, is the matrix. Right? Because the matrix is this. You're entrapped in a world of illusion. There are evil overlords who are trying to keep you entrapped so you don't ever discover who you truly are, right? But you know, remember, there's a scene in the movie, you said, you, like, you know, like a splinter in your mind that there is something wrong and you don't belong, right? That's the Matrix. Or, you can see a movie starring Jim Carrey, the Truman story. Notice, of course, the play on words there. Right, true man, Truman, discovering who you really are. And he grows up in a world, right, with an overlord that has manufactured. And the overlord's name, Christus. <laughs> Christus. <laughs> to keep him from ever actually getting his true agency, finding true love, etc. And what he has to do is get the knowledge in order to get beyond this God. We keep telling this story because it's a myth. Because it keeps pointing us to patterns that are pervasive and profound and powerful. And we can't quite articulate them and we can't quite know them. But the myth at least gives us a moment of, right, at least narrative and symbolic recognition of our suffering. probably makes the point so anyway and watch the whole thing so you have the self-transcendence and that's the goal and and so we seek strategies and vehicles for experiencing the self-transcendence and, and you ultimately want to live in it and where you master you and this is where we get into the circular me that i was referring to with with uh with brett weinstein's idea of well i'm programmed as a as an assassin robot but all i need to do is deny my programming and and in fact if you watch the matrix that's the entire struggle that neo is dealing with so after after morpheus releases him from the you know unplugs him from the matrix and then they plug him into their training program morpheus keeps basically telling neo trying to show him in the context of the program this is how you know you're just in a program this is just a building this is this is a, you know, this is not ultimate reality. And the entire point of the Matrix is that Neo realizes that, you know, he can dominate this reality. And it's a, you know, of course, the first of the three movies was the best, but it's a very powerful image. And, and, and even as I mentioned, I'm going to mention my Sunday school class that I taught last week because I wound up teaching this stuff, which is sort of the way it works in my Sunday school class because... A little bit later, we'll get into what is a gospel, but 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 you get into these questions of okay, well, what is real? What is reality? Is the dream real? Yeah, the dream is a, the dream is real. It's a real dream, but the alarm alarm clock is more real. And my my little famous now cell phone holder. This is this is quite real, but in a sense, I as the agent in this world am more real still because conscious agents with plans who created the formal cause and you know you look at aristotle's caught four causes you know devised this and mined the ore and you know composed you know created the metal to have these certain qualities so it's it's quite rigid and you know dust uh, you put this coating on it so it doesn't you know it doesn't rust and this is this is probably this is probably aluminum maybe not i don't know and and you know you put this hole in it so that back in the day when i bought this you could have your your power plug go in here and you could have the wire go through there if you wanted it to so it's just a nice little cell phone holder but we've got all of this design in it so in a way this is real but the the colonization the formation of this is in a way more real than the thing itself because it it controls it it sets its destiny and someday this will head to a landfill and live in a landfill for who knows how long probably until jesus comes again or some future generation digs it up and says i could use this metal
Now, as I said before, we have this we have this business about virtual reality. A, a bunch of people pointed me to this video that's sort of gone viral where a a real pastor I, I just watch the language a real pastor so i guess this is guy's a pastor in real life but he's in some virtual reality room sort of like the matrix and uh, drumsy he baptizes drumsy who's kind of an anime figure an anime girl and you know, baptizes her in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But of course, these are two people sitting in virtual reality rooms, hundreds or dozens or thousands of miles apart, and there's no real water. And so here they have a virtual reality baptism. But but notice how the the poster of the video quite smartly says real pastor instead of virtual pastor when we used real pastor to mean someone who actually has flesh not a computer simulation we maintain a bias for connection with the physical world and, and so even though in some ways the engineers and the business see the engineers are both physical and mental they have mind but the business that created this well it has manifestations in paper and office buildings but the business itself is is not real in the sense that this is real but yet the business is more real in that in a sense it produces it so the the, the talking about reality is is not a simple thing is the business more real or is the cell phone holder more real? Well, it depends what you mean by real. Well, in this case, is the baptism real when it's done in virtual reality? Now, if you listen to the video, you'll hear the pastor talk about, you know, all of these, you know, the water is God's love and he's making up a fair amount. Well, I'm not. I'm not criticizes theology right now but you know i watched and all kinds of thoughts go through my head as 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 this guy is is doing his baptism would you find a virtual heaven sufficiently satisfying and actually often when i talk about the the ways in which a lot of contemporary churches in america are gnostic their eschatology is Gnostic because they say something like, well, basically, when you die, you go to heaven to be with Jesus. Well, what about your body? Well, your body stays in the ground. Well, what do you, what are you in heaven? Well, I'm a consciousness. I'm a free-floating consciousness. It's like I'm a virtual reality avatar, but that's, you know, there's no reality to me. And every Easter, I'll talk about this, and I'll differentiate this from what I think is orthodox christianity which is the belief in the resurrection now now part of this is because in most cases our virtual worlds are dependent on our physical world so there's actually a server someplace that is hosting this meetup room each of these people have their own computers they have their own virtual reality headsets and so once again the virtual world is dependent on the physical world in cases like this but again when we get to consciousness the questions get tricky now this is in a way where we get into the simulation argument because well what if we we are quickly getting to the point that we can imagine fooling ourselves with representations we create on computers and there's a thing called the turing test which was developed by alan turing in 1950 and it's a test of a machine's ability to exhibit intelligent behavior equivalent to or indistinguishable from a human being and right now they've often tried to do this through speech and they keep doing this and saying when will we get to the point that we can fool human beings and have them talking to a computer but they but they think they're talking to another human being and this gets very complicated in terms of definition but this this always sort of leans us into the simulation argument and of course this still is from Elon Musk at the recode conference where where josh topolsky asks him you know what what are the odds that we're in base reality well what do you mean by base reality the reality where like the alarm clock does to the dream or like on the uh 
uh, Nebuchadnezzar, which was the name of the Matrix hovercraft, where, uh, I forget, what's his head, unplugs his unplugs his fellow soldiers and kills them by unplugging them when they're in the matrix because it's like their brain is supposed to be in two places or something like that but but the the nebuchadnezzar in the matrix is base reality and the servers and all the computer systems that in a sense is base reality upon which the virtual reality is dependent upon so elon musk is asked you know what are the odds that we're in virtual reality well basically the argument from the simulation goes how likely is it that we meaning us right here got there first or is it more likely that someone else did and that we are now um and that we are not living in base reality and that's elon musk says billions to one which is Wow, that's quite a stark statement. And that the problem with the simulation argument is that it leads us to imagining that this consciousness we're experiencing is the product of some kid's PC in a basement playing a really long computer game, or that we would simulate ourselves, or that aliens are simulating. And you see right away, what we are doing is concocting these alternate realities based on our own brains and imagining things based on the the furniture of our own world. And that's not really what I think about when I think about the simulation argument. I think about basically a different fact, which is that what if, in fact, well, we've been talking about this throughout pretty much the history of philosophy. And when I when I talked about um, Paul Maxwell's video, you know, it is this wonderful little this wonderful little video where you could chart out the history of philosophy. You know, ancient philosophy as metaphysics, modern philosophy focuses on epistemology, postmodern philosophy focuses on axiology, metaphysics, what is base reality? That's the question. And so the Greeks were talking about that, and Plato was talking about that. It's the forms, and Aristotle kind of brings it back down to earth, and the, the pre-Socratics, you know, it's, it's change, it's the swerve, it's, you know, Heraclitus, all of these, all of these philosophers asking, what is base reality? And by the time we get to to Descartes, we have modern philosophy, and now we're just basically focusing on epistemology. How can we have knowledge? And then post, you know, it, it's interesting because at, as as this history of philosophy develops, we get more and more skeptical because by the time we hit the modern period, well, we can't know base reality, so let's let's just camp on epistemology. And by the time you get to postmodernity, well. All that epistemology is corrupt because we're all motivated, and so what must we do? And off a thousand other conversations go. But if we get down to both Donald Hoffman and Jordan Peterson, Donald Hoffman in his TED Talk, which you can find, do we see reality as it is? Donald Hoffman says no, evolutionarily not. Um, that's we, we are not tooled to see reality as it is, Donald Hoffman asserts, but we are tooled for, for tricks and hacks. Donald Hoffman says, and it's not actually far from what Jordan Peterson says in terms of, well, we see this, this low-resolution image that's good enough to help us get in the world. Now, that doesn't mean that there isn't a reality out there that we're engaging with, but it's Donald Hoffman says there's there's an interface. Well, well, that sounds kind of weird, but if you stop and you think about, well, I'm using my eyes, and as I get older, my eyes are you know, less and less, my eyes are not what they were 20 years ago. They're still pretty good. I still don't have to wear glasses, but they're not what they were 20 years ago. And so sometimes text is a little bit fuzzy and I have to hold things out a little bit far, but it's, it's good enough for what I need to do. And if I need to do something a little bit better, I'll take a pair of reading glasses and I'll put that on and, and then it'll be a little bit better. And, and so, well, it's, it's it's an interface that I use, and we know that dogs' eyes don't see like our eyes do. Flies' eyes don't see like our eyes do. Certain shrimp can see more colors than we can see. Some women can see more colors than men can see, you know, so on and so forth. That that we don't, but but we see enough to be able to manipulate and to interact with this reality, with this with this stuff, with this world outside ourselves but we are in fact engaging in an interface of of sorts and the interface is actually 
it's built into us. Peterson's a priori argument in terms of his conversation with Sam Harris, but but it but it also it, it's it's a meeting between the two worlds in a sense. So we use a priori sorting mechanism to see the world, and you know again if you go back to Verveke stuff, I look at this and it's it's graspable and and graspability is not a is is not a property of this thing itself necessarily it's it's something that that we bring into it in in terms of when well, we're all together and here's a well here's a clock and and you know graspability but if i were going to throw something well it depends on this has various aspects of graspability for me, but it's kind of light, and this is a little bit heavier, and so we have all these qualities. And of course, I've got the well, the stapler's pretty heavy. I got all these things, but other things aren't nearly as graspable. Well, you know this 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 tripod. Well, this is kind of grasp, but this is swingable. You know, and I've got all these. And this is sort of mountable. So you have all these properties that are here, and then I look at my water bottle. My water bottle is very graspable, and you know all of this is built in. On we go. And then the, a little bit of this this video with um, Rupert Sheldrake, who's a very interesting character, and and he walks through and he's this video is there something rather than nothing, and he he quotes Lawrence Krauss's book, is there something rather you know, is there some dealing with is there something rather than nothing, and he, he notes that actually the increasingly the the atheist the atheist physicists and scientists are have pretty much a similar argument as religious people. They just get really annoyed at religious language because supposedly laws of nature are pre-existent and universal, which is sort of like the Logos, as you would find in in, in John 1 and Genesis 1. Well, John 1 written over into Genesis 1. And this quantum vacuum, which is sort of energy, is basically the spirit that's blowing over the wind, that's blowing over the waters. And... Boom, there you have creation. The only question, of course, is the difference of mind and personal or impersonal. So you have all this um, volatility or non-volatility, and so really the great divide is whether something is personal or impersonal. And, and what I increasingly bump into is that we are deeply troubled by the question of whether or not there is a will greater than our own. Now this to me, this fascinates me. Because as Thomas Nagel tries to get at with his book Mind and Cosmos, that we've sort of reached the end of this objectivistic approach to the world, and we recognize that unless we bring in subjectivity one way or another, we really can't find a path forward. But but we we don't really want there to be a god. Because, well, why? Because a god is going to be doing picking and choosing, and we don't want a god, we don't want anybody else picking and choosing for us, especially not someone we trust. And maybe if they're other human beings, maybe we'll think they're people of goodwill, and so on and so forth. But we hope to be the top willful agent, or at least be part of that class. And we look around and imagine if I, as a moral agent, were planning the universe, I would do so with less suffering and less waste. And in fact, almost every debate I hear between apologists and celebrity atheists has this subtext running beneath it. That I would be more, that I am more moral than any God you might imagine or find in the Bible. And then so often the apologists are kind of backtracking and trying to you know, spruce up. They're, in a sense, the rider on the back of the God elephant, and they're trying to improve his reputation by reading Bible verses in one way or another. And I've done the same thing. But if that, but what, it, what this is all really built on is a thousand years of Christianity that, um, that you really need to have the problem of evil that we have today. Well, why do I say that? Because if you had pretty much like the ancients or other civilizations around the world if you looked out into nature you wouldn't be under any you wouldn't be under any idea that nature should be good to you in fact nature was horribly dangerous for you and you had to do everything you could just to stay alive you didn't have a meaning crisis but uh, you sure wanted to eat 
So, so what happens, I think, after a thousand years of Christianity, after all of this messaging that, well, God number one, the God of the universe is good and it's built in, well, suddenly we're thinking, nah, we could do better. And if, if there is a God, you know, certainly we wouldn't have all this waste. If we were running a simulation, we would make it much happier for the people. Of course, you can watch The Matrix. They actually discuss that in that movie, too. All of these ideas we actually get from the Gospels. Well, what are the Gospels? Well, the Gospels are these books, these four books at the beginning of the New Testament that have the stories of Jesus. And I'm just starting in my adult Sunday school class um, a study on the, the Gospel of John. And so I began begin with it asking about what the Gospels are. C.S. Lewis has a, a really nice little write-up on Gospels. Come on, Microsoft, you can do it. What's the, what's the deal? Just pull up that website. I'll put the link in the notes. I don't know why this is. Literature in the gospel genre. Uh, C.S. Lewis writes, whatever these, men may, um, whatever these men may be as biblical critics, I, dis I distrust them as critics. They seem to lack any literary judgment. To be imperceptive about the very quality of the text they are reading, it sounds a, it sounds... It sounds a strange charge to bring against the men who have been steeped in these books all their lives. But that might be just the trouble. A man who has spent his youth and manhood in minute study of New Testament texts and of other people's studies of them, whose literary experience of these texts lacks any standard of comparison such, such as can only grow from a wide, deep, and genial experience of literature in general, is, I should think, very unlikely to miss the obvious thing about them. If he tells me that something in a gospel is legend or romance, I want to know how many legends or romances he has read, how well his palate is trained in detecting them by the flavor, and how many years he has spent on that gospel. I have been reading poems, romances, vision literature, legends, myths, all my life. I know what they are like. I know that not one of them is like this. Of this text, there, is, there are only two possible views. Either this is reportage, though it may no doubt contain errors, pretty close up to the facts, nearly as close as Boswell, or else some unknown writer in the second century without known predecessors or successors suddenly anticipated the whole technique of modern novelistic realistic narrative. If it is untrue, it may be narrative of that kind. The reader who doesn't see that is simply not learned to read. That's C.S. Lewis's take on what the Gospels are. And you can read Richard Bauckham's study of Jesus and the eyewitnesses, where he goes through all the namings. And, and again, well, it was very interesting in my Sunday school class, just to a, a group of people who are church-going people, I said, well, what is a gospel? And they worked on things a little bit, and one woman says, well, it's history. Ah, it's history. Now, if you know anything about history, you know that well, history itself is a complicated word, but... It is history. It, it is, C.S. Lewis lays this out quite nicely in The Grand Miracle, which is a doodle that you can find on YouTube or you can read it in C.S. Lewis's book, Miracles. It is, it is a story that fits into the rest of the story and illuminates the world. And now myths do that, so it is mythological in that sense, but it is also history. And C.S. Lewis goes through the fact that, in fact, it's quite important that the miracles, you can't take out of the miracles out of Christianity like you could out of Islam or Buddhism or, or just about any other religion because the miracles function in a particular way in Christianity precisely because it is history. Let me get into this question of reality. Now, one of the, one of the great things that I've been picking up by listening to John Verveke's class are all the ways that religions provoke mental transformation transformations. There's lots of ways and lots of religions and lots of ways of seeing the events on the ground differently. And, and John has really helped me understand Christianity and other religions and, and humanity and cognitive science. He's continuing to do that so much better throughout this entire class, where I see all these transformations that happen 
via texts and rituals and you know, all of these things that he's been laying out. There's lots of ways of modulating the meaning for a particular event. One of the best examples I think of this is the movie Life is Beautiful, which I, I like the movie. I heard a thing with Zizek, who I guess he doesn't like the movie, but Zizek is Zizek. Life is Beautiful is this incredible movie where in the midst of a of a Nazi death camp, this father tries to spare not only the life of his son, but the mental outlook of his little boy, the anguish of watching all of these people die. And the whole movie is basically him pulling the wool over on German guards one way or another, making his little boy think that this German, this Nazi death camp is actually a big game and at the end, he might win a prize such as a tank. And if you've never seen the movie, watch the movie. It's an amazing movie. But but it's it in many ways illustrates a lot of the stuff that John Verveke is is talking about. That there are these transformations that the that the father is doing on the son in order to reframe all of the events into other events for the son. Okay, so you transform the experience by transforming the story or your experience of the events. And, and, and to a great degree, this is what we do with suffering and meaning. There's an event that is causing suffering, and then via meaning, you reframe it, and you can, in fact, then try to eliminate suffering. Now, obviously, with, with Buddhism, suffering can be caused by the delta of, of desire, and experience or eliminate expectation or eliminate desire and, and therefore you can eliminate suffering these are all mental techniques and tricks not only by individuals but civilizations therefore you use meaning to to you leverage meaning in order to reduce suffering to give meaning and purpose and to basically help you get through life and both Peterson and Verveke talk about this quite a bit in their own different ways. Now this is in contrast to the continuous cosmos approach where you're using agency or power to tailor the story to your liking. And so when Verveke is talking about Alexander the Great, he talks about Alexander the Great as kind of a step back to a continuous cosmos approach. Alexander conquers the world and tailors the world to his liking this axial age two story now there to somebody had mentioned in the comments you mean two story as in terms of a house yeah it's also two story as in terms of the other meaning of story the story works both ways you have a you have two stories going on it's the interaction of those stories or it's two stories and a house and so Alexander the Great in a sense says no I'm just going to retail I'm just going to reshape the world according to my liking okay but if you don't have that kind of power or agency in the world then you default to some of these other techniques where you say well my life is I'm a slave and you know I've been sold out by my brothers and I was doing pretty well in Potiphar's house but then Mrs. Potiphar took a liking to me and she lied about it and now I'm stuck in jail but God has a purpose for my life and, and that somehow then you know helps reduce the suffering if you're poor Joseph stuck in slave prison in Egypt now John has I haven't really treated yet episode 16 which I know a number of you have asked me to and I'll probably get around to it uh, his treatment of Christianity at the end of episode 15 was really quite dramatic because here he he shows how agape is used to transform and it's not only used to transform the meaning that we attach to events but it's also actually used to transform people's lives and so a baby or the book of Ezekiel has a wonderful story of a, a king who, who picks up a, an abandoned baby and, and raises her to be queen. Now there's mental transformation and there's physical transformation. And, and so then we get into recognizing how agape can actually bring physical transformation into this world. And this is why I say that the company... Now, a company is not a physical thing. A company has physical aspects around it, but the company itself is not a physical thing, is in some ways more real than 
the product it made. There's some aspects in which you might say, well, this is more real than the company. The company could go out of business and this thing could endure. Physical things have that quality, but the meaning of this, now it's interesting because I've used this in a number of my videos, I have actually added meaning to this little cell phone holder. Um, it's not actually in the cell phone holder, but let's say someday I become, probably after my death, my videos become enormously famous, and someone finds, you know, maybe my kids need money, and they say, we're going to sell off all the props in Dad's office. And so who wants the cell phone holder that Paul Vanderclay used in his reality video? How about the stapler? You know, maybe 100 bucks for the cell phone holder. We don't even have cell phones anymore. They're implanted in our brains. Maybe maybe 150 for the stapler. One heck of a ripoff at the estate sale at the Vanderclays. But you, you get my point here that these transformations happen, and agape is this transformative power that turns slaves into citizens. And in fact, that transformative power over a great number of decades did just that, turn slaves into citizens, and, you know, both in the medieval evil period and then in the American period. Now, at, um, Christianity also uses axial type two-story cosmology to transform. Jesus says, store up treasures in heaven where moth and rust don't consume. That's what he admonishes. And, and you're suffering when you're suffering, you're doing so for the Lord. So Christianity actually uses multiple techniques that other religions use and to reframe the story it says okay so you're living in a you're living in a death chamber which is planet earth we all die you're living in a death chamber and maybe your circumstances within this death chamber are uncomfortable by virtue of the story we will transform your experience within this world other religions do that too it also promises change in the events on the ground, and that's where this next level comes into play. The miracles in Christianity are used not only in kind of the traditional way. Miracles were used to show divine favor, to show divine authority upon a person. In, in fact, I, I asked my Sunday school class, you know, it's likely nobody in Alexander's period, they knew that his father was Philip of Macedonia, they probably knew exactly who his mother was, yet they called Alexander the Great a son of God. Well, why is Alexander the Great the son of God? Well, because of what he did. And you think, well, that's not how we use son right. We tend to think about the word son biologically. In the ancient world, they often used son in terms of authority. All right, and so you'd see the Caesars adopting sons to be Caesar, and uh, Alexander the Great is the son of Philip of Macedonia, and I don't know the mother's name, but they called him a son of God, not because he was born of a god, but because his aspects were godlike, and that's why John Verveke says, you know, this is back to the continuous cosmos. continuous cosmos impression of the world. It's not the right word. So miracles. Well, miracles often are used to demonstrate power, divine authority. And, and in fact, with Roman Catholicism, now I'll probably get this wrong because I'm not Roman Catholic, but um, before someone is canonized as a saint, they need to have performed a miracle. And, and in a sense, it's using miracles in demonstrating divine authority divine authority and sanctity. But, but Jesus used miracles not only for that, but also as signs. And in the Gospel of John, as I go through the Gospel of John in my Sunday school class, we'll call it signs. They're signs of the age to come. They point to the age to come. So water to wine, well, this was, this was showing the abundance of the age to come right there at the wedding of Cana. In a sense, you pull something from the future into the present. You pull something from that age to come into the present. And as I've said before, Christianity tells time in a particularly interesting way. You have the present evil age and you have the age to come, but they overlap. 
And so Christians live in the overlap between the present evil age, the age of decay as I call it, and then the age to come. That's where Christians live, and that was started at the resurrection of Jesus. And so what Jesus is doing, and you can read C.S. Lewis's miracles about that, miracles of the old creation, miracles of the new creation. I like the way he, he lays that out. Jesus is, is showing signs of the reality of the age to come. It's not just power. He's embodying what is to come in what he's showing the people. And now the greatest miracle then is well, the resurrection, where his future body and our future bodies come into the present, which is why in the New Testament the apostles keep talking about the, the end times. We're in the last days because of the resurrection of Jesus. And that gets us back to this word-based reality. What if Jesus' resurrected body is to this world as your alarm clock is to your dream world? I'm going to read that again. What if Jesus' resurrected body is to this world as your alarm clock is to your dream world? Your alarm clock impinges into this world. It is more real than your dream. Jesus' resurrected body does the same in gospel stories. In a sense, so do the loaves and fishes, but not like Jesus' body. And so that's why the New Testament always talks about the last days. The message of Christianity is the promised participation in Jesus' body. Now, meaning it in that case, metaphorically, but that's basically the assertion of 1 Corinthians 15. Now, sometimes people will ask, why do you, Paul, continue to insist in the bodily resurrection of Jesus? It is because of my idea of reality. That just as the alarm clock, or the phone, or the crying baby, or the annoying dog, or the sun, opens your eyes and colonizes and invades and temporarily destroys your dream world, well, Jesus' resurrected body invades this world. And, well, it's a greater, it's a deeper level of reality. It's base reality. That's what Christianity says. So, where's that fudge? Reality and the resurrection.